What's going on, YouTube world? My name is Lauren Wilson. I am an Arizona School of Ministry student. I will be done with my schooling at the end of 2024. I also have my MBA. I have passed all four parts of the CPA exam. I'm a management consultant in the health fitness industry, and I'm also a run coach. And, and my goals for getting my pastoral license is I, as I just got involved in church, a lot of people, they're open to these different conversations and a lot of people want to try to maximize their well-being while they're here. However, the traditional religious tracks and the way that religion presents itself in culture has been a turnoff for people. So my goal for this channel is to create constructive conversations for those that I like to call or refer to the de church, the unchurched, and those that have suffered church hurt and fellow truth seekers. I truly believe that by having constructive conversations, going after truth, that we can maximize our own personal well being and we can maximize the well being um, across people, across time, across the world. And so today, what I wanted to do is I wanted to unpack Proverbs 9 10. And I wanted to go into the second topic, the goal for this, is what is truth? How do we know what is true and what is not true? And do we even know if anything is true? So what does Proverbs 9, 10 say? It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And so this was my second ever homework assignment in the Arizona School of Ministry. And so I, I unpacked this about a year and a half ago. And I have my paper in front of me. That's what we're going to use. But before we do that, I wanted to ask ChatGBT the following. So I put into the ChatGBT engine, what is truth? How do we know anything? Do we know anything? Or are we weighing evidence and experiencing life to determine truth? Is truth objective or subjective? Um, I haven't ChatGBT this. I haven't Googled this. So we're going to go on this journey together of what ChatGBT says. And so here we go. Give it a second here. And I'm just going to go ahead and read it real quick. And then we'll go back to Proverbs 9.10. So what ChatGPT is saying, you can read it on the screen. I'm also going to go ahead and read it out loud. The nature of truth and how we come to know anything are deeply philosophical questions that have been debated for centuries. Well, that's good. That means we're not going to solve it in a 15 to 20 minute YouTube episode, but it's worth discussing. Here's an exploration of these concepts. What is truth? Truth can be understood in various ways. Correspondence theory of truth. This theory posits that truth is what corresponds to reality or facts. If a statement accurately describes the way things are, it is true. Coherence theory of truth. According to this theory, truth is determined by the coherence of a set of beliefs or propositions. If a belief fits well within a system of interconnected beliefs, it is considered true. Pragmatic theory of truth. This perspective suggests that truth is what works or has practical effects. If a belief or statement proves useful and effective in practice, it is truth. Deflationary theory of truth. This theory argues that truth is not a substantial property, but merely a linguistic convenience. Saying a statement is true is just a way of asserting, a way of asserting the statement itself. And so what we... Before I continue on, how do we know anything? A lot of people say that this reality is just an illusion, that consciousness itself is projecting an illusion. And one of the reasons I don't like that, because if it's just an illusion, does anything have meaning and does anything have purpose? And so why are we wired to experience this world as though it is real to us. So the whole illusion conversation starts to deconstruct very quickly because I feel like there's no utility to that. Because if even if it is an illusion, it doesn't seem like it is from our perspective and our perceptual lens. And then other things are saying is 
okay, it's just merely a linguistic convenience, so nothing is true. It's all subjective. And I feel like that is dangerous as well because if something tragic happens, such as the Holocaust, is that wrong or is that right? We would agree across cultures, across people, across time, that that is wrong, that it's not subjective, that is it, it's objectively wrong to devalue another person. And so that means that there is some sort of rubric or some sort of system, some sort of standard that we grade ourselves against that exists outside of us. So it's not merely a linguistic convenience. And even if that's not true, that it doesn't exist independently of us, I would argue that we act as though it it is and it benefits us to act as though it is. And so is there a difference? Can you even decouple those two thoughts and so how something affects the human experience and so my own thoughts on this is truth is made up of our rational rational thoughts logic there is emotions evolved and then there's our own experience and so some things are objective such as peer-reviewed scientific terms we're, we're never a hundred percent sure on anything but through repeatable experiments across people across time, if the same results are yielded, we tend to accept that as true. And so we can deny gravity all we want, but if you go outside and you step off a building, the results of not believing that isn't going to lead to an outcome of something that's not injury or death, right? And so let's go back to, to, to chat GBT. So how do we know anything? Epistemology, the study of knowledge, addresses how we know what we know. Some key approaches include empiricism. This view holds that knowledge comes primarily from sensory experience. We know things because we observe and experience them. And so going back to what I said, one of the elements of truth was our own experience. We process information we take action, we have thoughts, we get input, and then based off that experience, we start to troubleshoot and navigate the future. And so based off of the empiricism, this means that if we study history, because again, from a Christian worldview, one of the things is, was Jesus, is Jesus actually God? And it's a lot of people will argue, no, that's all made up. You, There's no way you can know that. I'm not sure. And then the rebuttal comes, though, or the question becomes, well, how do you know anything? How do you know Abraham Lincoln was real? How do you know George Washington was real? How do you know that Rome was a country? How do you even know what's going on on the other side of the world currently right now? How do you know any of that? Unless you have been there, you've experienced it with your own senses, there is some sort of other mechanism that you have taken in to accept a truth or a belief system. And that is taking evidence and using your rational faculties, using your emotional valence, and using your experiences through your cultural lens and your own personal experience. You decide what truth is. You decide what authority figures to trust, you decide what stories to believe, and then those authority figures that you put your trust in, those stories that you put your trust in, those help you navigate the unknown future. And so you pick those stories based off of a value system. You pick which authority figures to trust based off of a value system. And we live in an interesting time because up until currently, there was only so many ways to get information. We didn't have all this media that we have now. And so not that long ago, you just kind of trusted locally what was going on, what you heard out on the streets, what you heard at work, what you heard at church, what you heard maybe at the bar. That's how information flowed. Then we had TV, and you had news stations, and you had personality TV hosts pushing information at you, and that's how you got information. And then you had books as well. 
but then we have radio and now we have social media and this is important because for the first time in the history of the earth multiple or very various numerable innumerable amounts of thoughts and opinions can flow to the cultural projection before it was limited to those that had control over the radio waves control over the tv waves control over the messaging that was getting out now with our phones and with internet anyone can project a thought and so now it really becomes okay with all of these different worldviews how do we discern what is real what should we even focus on is it even important and so going back to to jet gbt here rationalism rationalists argue that knowledge can be gained through reason and logical deduction independent of sensory experience so from rationalism there is objective facts there's objective truths and through logical deduction we can uncover these truths and then through peer-reviewed study so repeatable experiments and repeatable results across people across time we can start to deduct these objective truths and but then the question becomes how could an unconscious immoral universe have objective fine-tuned truths from every single experience that i've had with my own rationality if i see order outside so for instance if i see a message written in the sky out of smoke and it says my name lauren l-o-r-i-n wilson my rational deduction is something conscious and something with rationality had to create that order i don't believe that an unconscious irrational mind or force created that and so then the when we look at the universe and we look at the fine tuning and we look at how precise these universal laws are from our own rational deduction one could conclude that a rational force which is a mind had to create this because i've never seen disorder or i've never seen order come from an irrational mindless force so therefore one can deduct that something rational with consciousness created the order of the universe that from our own rational exp in an experience one would deduct that constructivism this approach suggests that knowledge is constructed by individuals through interactions with their environment and their experience so again this is your own experience inputs and outputs actions outcomes troubleshoot keep going skepticism skeptics question the possibility of certain or absolute knowledge arguing that we may never truly know anything with complete certainty and so let's just keep going just for the sake of time weighing evidence and experiencing life in practice many people combine elements of these approaches we weigh evidence use reason and draw on our experiences to form beliefs and understandings this process is often iterative and involves constant reevaluation as new information becomes available. Is truth objective or subjective? The debate over whether truth is objective or subjective is central to many philosophical discussions. Objective truth. If truth is objective, it exists independently of our beliefs, perceptions, or feelings. It is universal in the same for everyone, regardless of individual perspectives subjective truth if truth is subjective it depends on individual or cultural perspectives what is true for one person or group may not be true for another in many cases the nature of the truth might depend on the context for example scientific truths are generally considered objective because they rely on empirical evidence and reproducibility in contrast Truths about aesthetic judgments or moral values may be seen as more subjective, influenced by personal or cultural viewpoints. Truth and knowledge are complex and multifaceted concepts. While some truths may be objective and independent of human perception, others may be subjective and shaped by individual or cultural context. Our understanding of truth and knowledge often involves a combination of weighing evidence, rational deliberation, and experiential learning.
The ongoing exp exploration of these questions is central to philosophy, science, and everyday life. Okay. So personally, my personal belief before we dive into Proverbs 9:10, and I would love to hear y'all's thoughts on this on this subject because one of the truths is as a finite information processing machine, it's impossible for one person to know all of the truth. So a lot of our belief systems and what we take as, for granted as true are not true. And that is a fact that not everything you think and believe at the current moment is actually true. So just something to think about as you navigate and as you have these constructive conversations that you may actually be wrong. So I want to throw that out there with 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 humbleness. But my my viewpoint is I believe in very objective truths. Yes, how we experience the world per se is subjective, but I believe that morality itself is objective. I believe that there's an objective moral truth that exists independently of us, just like there is objective scientific truths that exists independently of this. And the reason I believe that is because across cultures, across time, we're, we are moving towards respecting the human dignity of every single person and that we believe collectively that the Holocaust is wrong. Yes, statistically speaking, there are people that don't believe that, but I believe that Something inside of them knows that it's wrong to to kill other people on a mass scale, especially uh, just because of something that someone can't control. And that there's this isn't the, the episode for this, but there is a difference between justice and murder. And so for me, the second half of that thought, though, is while I believe morality is objective and a part of an objective truth that exists independently of us. I will say that there is room that we are collectively trying to discover and uncover what that is, just like we're trying to continue to discover objective scientific truths. And I know that may not be popular from a Christian worldview, from a Christian perspective. However, to me, that makes the most sense. And even though we have the Bible, and I believe it is the word of God, I also understand that there's many different translations. And just like the game of telephone, things get lost in translation. And so besides just this word of God, which I know has been corrupted by man, it's undoubtedly been corrupted by man. That's what the whole history of Christianity is. I have to use my other faculties of exploring truth such as my experience and my rational deduction of logic to figure out which parts are true in the objective sense and which parts have been corrupted. And again, I know that's not popular. However, that is where I am personally at with my daily walk and my daily wrestle with God and with the Lord. And I think that there's a, there's a hierarchy of values and so by that, there's a hierarchy of truths as well. And, and for me, the two greatest commandments and the greatest commission is the highest truth and the highest value that God gives us and Jesus Christ gives us. And those two greatest commandments are love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and love your neighbor as you love yourself and then baptize everybody in this message in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So spread these two commandments because God the Father is spirit. Jesus the Son is the embodiment of God's attributes, and the Holy Spirit is our divine spark with inside of us, the triune God. So spread that message of the Spirit, the embodiment of my attributes and my spirit, through the workings of the Holy Spirit to all corners of the earth. And so spread the fact that we should love God with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, and that we should love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Spread that message to all corners of the earth using the power of the Holy Spirit and try to maintain the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of righteousness, 
righteousness, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, gentleness, um, faithfulness, self-control, and kindness, and do that despite life's pain and suffering that is inevitable. Do your best to maintain that despite your physical pain and suffering. Try to maintain the fruit of the Spirit in your righteousness. So I believe that that truth is the highest truth out of the hierarchy of truth. I truly believe that. And why do I believe that? Because all of my experience has pointed me to that. That love is the answer to a lot of our problems. And then the debate comes, well, what is love and how do we define that? And how do we go about embodying that? And I believe that scripture helps us with that personally. So let's bring it back to the topic, though. Proverbs 9, 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And so this really dovetails or goes off of what I was just talking about, builds off of what I was just talking about, segues off of what I was just talking about. So the Bible goes into what is truth and what is real. And it says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And so let me go ahead and just read my homework assignment. Now, this scripture literally presented itself to me last Tuesday on the day we started the course. I have been chewing hard on what this means. It has confused me if I'm being completely honest. The following is my attempt at articulating the progress I have made thus far. Fear. What is fear? Why fear? To begin implies that we may not have yet begun. Wisdom. What is wisdom? Is there some sort of intellect beyond regurgitating facts? Are there some forms of higher thoughts? Wisdom implies importance beyond pure chess facts. Then the question begs, what is the importance of wisdom? Once we figure out what is wisdom, why is it important to accumulate wisdom? Knowledge. What is knowledge? What is it to know something? Understanding. What is understanding? How is this all different? That is, how is wisdom, knowledge, and understanding different? At first glance, they all seem to be the same. However, they cannot be in this context. So you have to explore deeper. The best way, in my opinion, to begin this conversation was with the concept of perception. Perception is the lens through which we as human beings experience the world. We experience the world through our five senses and our consciousness. Our consciousness gives us the experience of self. On page 29 of The Knowledge of the Holy One, which is the book we are reading and writing this paper about, it states, His constant assertion of self, as far as he thinks of it all, appears to him a perfectly normal thing. He is willing to share himself sometimes even to sacrifice himself for desired end, but never to dethrone himself. No matter how far down the scale of social acceptance he may slide, he is still in his own eyes a king on a throne, and no one, not even God, can take that throne from him. The self is our own ego. Every single person's consciousness slash ego makes them believe that they are the sinner of their world. And in a sense, this experience is accurate. However, ego is man's. Ego is not God's. Ego clouds us from the wisdom of God. So why fear? On page 84 of the Knowledge of the Holy, it states, the greatness of God rouses fear within us, but his goodness encourages us not to be afraid of him, to fear and not be afraid. That is the paradox of faith. Fear can make you freeze in your tracks. Freeze, fear causes you to tremble. More importantly, fear makes you humble. Fear dampens our ego. Fearing something is to give it power over you. It dampens your ego and allows the rest of your brain to be more receptive. When you are fearful, your awareness narrows. Your attention sharpens. Your senses are heightened. Think about being alone out in the woods or somewhere else that would scare you. Everything is extremely heightened. Your ego is dampened 
you're taking in the environment a lot more richly. Then it comes down to, hopefully, when in fear, your attention is on the right thing. If it is not, the fear can lead to your very end. So fear, the dampening of the ego, the humbling of the ego, the heightened senses of fear are the beginning of wisdom if properly aimed. Wisdom. When I think of this, I think of the process of accumulating knowledge. Someone has a thought. A thought is a word inside one's brain. The value of this thought word inside one's brain is its ability to organize the chaos in the world of infinite facts. Your ability to organize the chaos and then communicate it in a way that resonates deeply with the spirit of others. This seems to me to be what wisdom is. Words that deeply resonate with the spirit of other human beings rouses up the best in them. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Wisdom is the proper organization of words properly or effectively communicated that resonates with the deepest spirits within us. If God is the word, then God is wisdom. Ego clouds us and makes us believe that our wisdom is the wisdom. Fear dampens our ego, our sinful wisdom, and opens us up to listening to God's wisdom. Knowledge. What does it mean to truly know something? Knowledge comes in many different forms. In today's age, using the scientific method, we think of knowledge as something that is repeatable across people, across time. Repeatable, reliable, stands up to scrutiny from others over time. Then there's other forms of knowledge, such as the emotional knowledge, spiritual knowledge, motor skill knowledge, experimental knowledge, the power of a narrative or story directing our lives. These different forms of knowledge aren't in the same domain as the scientific method form of knowledge. They arguably are even richer forms of knowledge. We inherently know that great works of art resonate with us on a deeper dimension than any rational fact. Art sells for hundreds of millions of dollars. Books and movies sell millions of copies, are viewed billions of times. Why? They express what we inherently know about ourselves, yet sometimes we have a hard time expressing. To know something is to have it programmed so deeply into your nervous system that that there is no doubt to its effects on you. The knowledge of the holy is to embody the Holy Spirit. You have to know just as much about what something is not to know what something actually is. Therefore, the knowledge begins with knowing ourselves. We are finite, sinful beings. We are not God, so God is not finite or sinful. By knowing ourselves, which are not God, we can begin to know God. To begin to know God is to know his attributes and then turn thought into action. This action is embodiment. Through embodiment, you code something into your nervous system so deep it becomes subconscious or unconscious. It becomes mastery. This, along with spiritual appreciation for the finest of details that others cannot see, is the deepest form of knowing something. Understanding. To understand something is to comprehend it. Let's contrast this with a concept that can never be understandable. The infinitude of God or God's attribute of being infinite. This concept is hard to grasp. However, to me, while we can never comprehend this, there is a way to help ease our understanding of not understanding. God exists outside of time and space. Time and space is a human experience. When a person goes through emotional trauma, time eventually heals all. Time gives us something that allows for our trauma to be reprogrammed into something of more utility, more use. Time allows our suffering to be turned into resurrection and retribution. Now think of a timeless being. Something that exists outside of time would be infallible to the trauma of a finite being that experiences time. Then think of space. Space is a human experience based on our focal point of awareness. If we direct our attention to the immediate space around us, everything can seem overwhelming. The person cuts us off. 
the Starbucks order was messed up. Someone texted us something crazy. However, if we expand our focal point of awareness, that is our focal attention of space out far enough, things start to seem trivial. When you expand your conscious thought out to think of all the tragedy in the world, your day-to-day matters start to seem trivial. Expand our conscious thought all across enough time and space, and the rules of the game of human experience change. The things that matter change. You then realize that something that exists outside of the confines of time and space cannot possibly be harbored by such trivial things. While we can never be infinite like God, we can attempt to expand our conscious thought out across time and space and make it so we can focus more on what truly matters. That which matters most is God, his attributes, our relationship with him, in moving our e- earthly kingdom towards his glory. Knowing that we do not understand the Holy One, that we can never fully understand the Holy One, is the beginning of understanding the Holy One. And so those are my thoughts on truth and on Proverbs 9.10. Once again, the fear of of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And so if you got something out of this, thank you so much for your time if you actually watched this far. If you got something out of this, please like or subscribe. If you have some thoughts, throw them down in the comments. I would love to hear what y'all think on this. I'm always seeking out truth. I'm always seeking out understanding and and i would love to hear maybe there's some holes in my thinking and i would love to hear if you if you don't agree with something that i that i said i would love to hear it and i think at the end of the day if we just lean in humbly with love that there's going to be a lot of positivity and a lot of good fruit for a lot of us from this so thank you guys i love you and i hope you all have a great week and if you're watching this outside of a week i just hope that you are found safe And just remember that if you're watching this online, you have a lot to be grateful for because a lot of people don't have the time or the access to watch videos online. So, all right. Love you, human fam.